Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, UN report on children and armed conflict documents rise in grave violations. Cuba's Abdallah and Soberana 2 vaccines show positive results in late-stage trials. Workers across seven Amazon facilities in Germany launched three-day strike. And in our video section, we take a look at the rallies held in support of Pedro Castillo amid rising fears of a coup in Peru. In our first story, the UN has verified nearly 24,000 cases of grave violations committed during armed conflicts in 2020. These violations affected 19,379 children in 21 situations. These figures are part of the UN's annual report on children in armed conflict published on June 21st. It notes that the vulnerability of children grew under the COVID-19 pandemic. 8,521 children were recruited and used in conflicts and 2,674 were killed. Most of the violations were recorded in Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, Syria and Yemen. Cases of abduction grew by 90% and sexual violence by 70%. 98% of the victims of sexual violence were girls. However, these numbers are considered to be severely underreported. While the report documents widespread violations, it does not include Israel and the Saudi-led war in Yemen in its so-called list of shame. The UN verified over 4,400 grave violations in the country last year. Out of this, at least 194 children were killed and maimed by the Saudi Emirati coalition. Meanwhile, there have been 1,031 verified cases of violations by Israeli forces in the occupied territories and in Israel. The violations impacted 340 Palestinian and 3 Israeli children. Occupation forces killed at least 8 Palestinian children in 2020, while Israel's 11-day bombing of Gaza killed at least 66 children. The destruction of homes, schools and medical facilities has further affected thousands. According to Defense for Children International, 5 to 700 Palestinian children are detained and persecuted in Israel's military system each year. Some of these children are as young as 12 years old, with the most common charge being stone throwing. In our next story, Cuba's three-dose vaccine candidate Abdallah has demonstrated 92.28% efficacy in late-stage trials. President Miguel Diaz-Canel confirmed the news on June 21st. 48,290 volunteers participated in the vaccine's phase 3 trial starting March 22nd. They were administered three doses with an interval of three weeks. Meanwhile, the Finlay Institute announced on June 19th that Soberana 02 vaccine had demonstrated 62% efficacy with two of its three doses. This exceeds the minimum 50% threshold required for approval by the WHO. The third phase of the clinical trials for Soberana 02 began on March 4th. 44,010 people between the ages of 19 and 80 participated. The vaccine has proven effective against both original as well as mutant strains in late-stage trials. At present, Cuba has developed five COVID vaccine candidates. The country has recorded over 169,000 COVID cases and 1,170 deaths as of June 20th. Meanwhile, as of June 19th, over 2.24 million Cubans have received at least one dose of the most advanced vaccines. The strides made by Cuba are all the more significant given the over six-decade-long US embargo. The blockade and sanctions have restricted access to international finance and led to serious supply shortages. Despite this, Cuba's health minister has stated that 85% of the treatment protocol has been developed using national sources. Cuba has also sent delegations of its doctors to help fight the pandemic in different countries. Several countries including Bolivia, Venezuela and Cuba have now committed to open collaboration on vaccine technologies. Officials from these countries participated in the Summit for Vaccine Internationalism, which was concluded on June 21st. Cuba and Mexico have committed to open licensing of their vaccines. Countries have also committed to sharing regulatory and manufacturing capacities. This is crucial given that only 0.3% of the world's vaccines have been administered in poor countries so far. In our next story, we go to Germany where Amazon workers have launched a three-day strike. Starting from June 21st, employees across seven locations have stopped work. The strike has been called by the Verdi Union and will coincide with Amazon's Prime Day. The week's strike follows similar four-day action organized at the end of March. As per reports, monthly gross wages in retail, excluding motor vehicles, grew by around 25% between 2010 and 19. Meanwhile, the increase in mail order and on-rail retail, online retail stood at 12.3%. Wealthy has been demanding for almost a decade that Amazon recognize the collective wage agreement of the retail and mail order business. Industry-wide negotiations are ongoing with unions demanding a wage increase of 4.5%. They have also asked for an additional 45 euros per month and a minimum wage of 12.5 euros per hour. Another important demand is a declaration of the general validity of collective agreements. This will ensure that these also apply to those companies which are not a part of the Employees Association. Meanwhile, Amazon has announced a wage increase of 2.5%. The company has also pointed to additional benefits including bonuses and insurance. 
However, the union has pointed out that the wage increase is only a compensation for the increase in prices. Meanwhile, it has denounced the arbitrariness of these measures. The union argues that a collective agreement will offer workers legal certainty. And in our final story, we go to Peru where millions are still waiting for the official results of the presidential elections. Left-wing candidate Pedro Castillo won the election held on June 6th by a margin of around 44,000 votes. However, right-wing candidate Keiko Fujimori has refused to concede defeat. She has challenged around 500,000 votes without offering proper evidence of fraud or irregularities. Meanwhile, thousands of Peruvians have continued to hold rallies in solidarity with Castillo. Here's a video feature on the current situation in Peru. saliendo ¿por qué? porque se le avecina un fraude de parte de la señora Fujimori que no quiere aceptar ya conocemos su trayectoria ella está condenada prácticamente y no quiere aceptar su derrota porque sabe que de frente irá a prisión That's all your time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.